We turn our hearts to the Word of God, to Revelation chapter 20. Today are verses 1 through 10. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. And I read now in Jesus' name. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, and he locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Father, these are your words. They are eternal. They are true. I pray and ask this morning that you would sanctify us with your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I spent a lot of time reading this week and by God's grace, let us look at this scripture. Our first point is the binding of Satan for 1,000 years. There are at least three different views of how the end will come. A pre-mill and an ah-mill and a post-mill. The post-mill was very popular at the beginning of the Christian church. And, uh, and then it was quickly replaced by more of a pre-mill. And then pre-mill pretty much went non-existent but during the last 200 years the evangelicals have brought the pre-mill back into uh, prominence and then there is the ah mill and I will begin with uh, the post mill and I will only say this that the post millennials believe that Jesus and the Christians will militarily take over the entire world and then this will usher in a reign of Christ upon the earth for a thousand years. And I'm being very brief in these descriptions on purpose. There is resources available for anyone to read should you so choose. The pre-mill position believes that there is a, going to be then a literal reign of Christ upon the earth for a thousand years in which time Satan is bound by this chain and in the abyss. During that time, everyone that's born during that time will have the gospel preached to them and have the opportunity to receive Christ. At the end of that thousand years, Satan would be released and there would be a great battle and he would be defeated. Unfortunately, I am more persuaded as an amillennial. An amillennial believes that the spiritual reign is not a literal thousand years, but it is the reign of Christ, accomplished through his death and victory at the cross and the resurrection. Now, to make this honest, all of these groups have difficulties with different versions. All of these opinions have conflicts over Scripture. 
people sometimes have said to me, well, just read Ezekiel and Daniel. It's, it's all explained there. And I go, really? <laughs> Ezekiel and Daniel and Revelation all are prophetic literature, and they are difficult by their very nature to understand. I would be willing to admit that most likely different aspects of all of those opinions have valid truth because scripture often speaks in its prophetic literature about more than one event at the same time. For example, scripture that speaks of the coming of Christ is referring not only to his first coming in the Old Testament, but often includes his second coming in that same scripture. Therefore, it has multiple fulfillments. I would like to point out some spiritual truths that I believe are practical, that we can apply in our life. First of all, I would like to talk about the fact that Satan has been bound for sure in this one method that I can say. Or, as I said, maybe it'll be that some future day is coming when an earthly kingdom will be established and he is bound. But let's talk about today something practical. Through the preaching of God's word, through the law and the gospel, people are set free from the dominion, and I mean the word dominion, of darkness. Sin that has power over their life. Through the lies of Satan that have been going on since Adam and Eve are under, they're described in scripture as being dead. I'm talking about people who don't know Christ. They're described in scripture as people who are dead. They are also described in scripture as people who are slaves, who have no power over their spiritual life, but are basically held in bondage. There are many things in life that create bondage. Drugs, alcohol, compulsions, gambling, sexual immorality, trafficking of human beings, literal bondage. But there are also smaller things in life. Being unable to tell the truth, being able to be greedy, to be boastful and prideful, on and on. And people can't stop these things if they want to because they're dead and they're slaves. But Christ has been given the keys of the kingdom, which he then turned and gave it to his disciples. And his word is so powerful that it can break those chains of bondage and that dominion of the devil and transform their lives and save their souls. I didn't used to believe that. I believed everybody had to be converted and have a day when they were converted. And I kept running into these people who would say to me, I've always loved Jesus. And I would go, ah, you're not a Christian. And I've then I had my own children. The Lord Jesus Christ has power. And the world, the flesh, and the devil will always be at warfare. But they are not more powerful than Jesus. They are in subjection to him and to his church. Miracles can be worked in Jesus' name. Healings in Jesus' names. Praying for weather in Jesus' name. Because The kingdom is real and alive. There are many people who have these dramatic testimonies of terrible addictions and terrible situations. But to me, they're... So when you look at that and you see the power that changed their life, it's truly amazing. But they are no more powerful than someone who can say, I've always loved Jesus. That also is a miracle that have kept our children from wandering and gone off into sin. This victory of Christ is very real. To me, this is very practical. Satan has been defeated already. That's my first point today. His hold over us is over. Jesus is not going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's the first point that I feel is very practical for our lives. Do not be afraid. Do not feel like, 
all is lost. Do not put your hopes upon the things of this world which are temporary, but put your faith in Jesus Christ who is reigning already. Yes, we still live in a world under a curse and in subjection. But the end is coming. The second point are all the thrones and the souls. Very confusing to me. Very interesting. I can understand the idea of those who have been martyred for the sake of Christ. Specifically mentioned are some of these who are beheaded. And that they sit upon thrones. To judge what? To judge whom? It's difficult for me to come up with that answer. And to talk about the first resurrection and the second resurrection. And I would say, who are these others that are mentioned that are not part of the first resurrection? And no amount of reading on my part could give me answers that I felt at peace with over that regard. I believe that in some ways it's not wrong to say I don't know. And to continue to study and continue to pray. But I'm always about the practical. And what does this have to do with my practical life? The only practicality I can see in the thrones and the beheading is that all those who die in Christ are not lost. They are preserved. They are remembered. They are honored for their faithfulness. They are given authority. And they are under the authority of Jesus Christ. Their thrones are not above His. Think about what a tragedy it would be if our loved ones are lost. I also think about, when I think of this idea about the the beast and, and the mark of the beast, and you can't buy or sell without that mark. And the, the idea that um, your name then would not be written in the book of life. And again, when it comes to practicality, there's only one thing that can separate you from the love of God. Have you meditate, you know, Scripture interprets Scripture. Have you thought about Romans 8 where it says nothing can separate you from the love of God? Not death. The idea that a physical number can be put upon my body and therefore I would be separated from Christ does not fly with me when I look at Scripture. The only thing that can separate me from Christ is to deny Jesus. To turn my back upon Jesus. And perhaps when the beast and the mark, and they're talking about that, perhaps that's what they're indicating. That as you would take the mark, you would then literally deny Jesus Christ. And that's the crux of the matter, isn't it? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. What kind of pressures will be put upon us? What kind of pressures are put upon people? Even even in the last few years, in northern Iraq and Syria, people put to death, told to deny Christ or I'll kill your husband. Deny Christ or I'll kill your children. Same thing happening in southern Sudan in Chad with Boko Haram. They gather all the people together and they tell them, you deny Christ or I kill your children. Lord, help me. But guess what? Romans 15 tells us that that's exactly what God will do. That He will fill His believers with His Holy Spirit and help you when you face that situation. It is not practical to live in fear about that. But rather it is practical to see that all of these souls are preserved. That they are honored that they are remembered, that they are loved, that they are mentioned, and that they are part of the kingdom of God. That, to me, is practical. The third part is so obvious, but very practical as well. The third point is that Jesus wins. (laughs) This is very practical if you think about it. The whole mentioning of Satan's attempt here at the end, it's it's almost the same... uh, sequence of events that were described in chapter 19 regarding the beast and the false prophet gather the whole world together to face off against Jesus and lose and this is why I believe that all of these chapters are different lenses looking at the same sequence of events 
There's just a different lens. This lens is now the lens of looking at Satan. The other lens, the, the lens of looking at the false prophet. The lenses of the plagues. All these different views are all looking at the same thing. What is the same thing? The end. The end of the world. In which all lives will have to answer one question. The question that Jesus asked his disciples outside of city in Antioch. Who do people say that I am? He asks his disciples. And after they give all these different answers and rumors of what all the people are saying, then he very specifically says to them, And who do you say I am? And Peter responds and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he commended Peter for those words. He said the church is built upon those words. And this is what you cannot escape, my friends. Satan is going to lose. And there you will be, you and God. And what will happen to you? And the answer lies in that question. Who do you say I am? Satan will end up in the lake of fire the burning sulfur, the same place where the beast ended up, the false prophet, his power once and forever captivated within that place. Now I know that my answers may not have fit with how you look at things, but I hope that these three practical points can, that you would realize that God has given us great power through the gospel of Jesus Christ that you would realize that it will be well with our souls no matter what happens to us, that we will be preserved, and that you will realize that we win. It's over. Satan might as well not even play the game, but he will, because I'll tell you why he hates you, and he hates people's souls, and it is his desire and determination to bring as much pain and suffering as he possibly can in every form imaginable upon this earth and in eternity. And Jesus wants just the opposite. Victory is ours. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for this day. These verses are difficult. They have many difficulties for me and my understanding of it, and I'm sure for others. It's just not simple to explain. But it is important to look at the practical truths that can protect our lives and save us perhaps from deception and foolish things. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would redouble our commitment to you and to the church and to preaching the gospel and to teaching our children and raising them to walk with you and to love you and to live in daily faith and repentance. Help us, Lord, in our commitment with our Bible school and our seminary, our community, our witness among those around us. Be with those who serve in our government, in our law official places, and give them, Lord, wisdom and strength as they stand up for justice and what is right. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.